So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to see so many of you here this morning. I had a talk with one of the security staff in the elevator and discovered that some people have failed to answer their alarm calls this morning, which always gives problems to the security staff in a hotel. So perhaps the Portland beers have been uh, tasted rather better than wisely last night for some people, but it's good to have a nice crowd this morning. <laughs> And we're starting off this morning with the business panel, which runs for an hour from 8.30 till 9.30 in the capable hands of the Apache Software Foundation's Sally Kadiri. Sally, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here up and coffeeed up and ready to go. Um, I would love to introduce our panelists. I'm Sally Kadiri from the Apache Software Foundation. To my right is Bertrand Delacreta from Adobe. To his right is Phil Robb from HP. And to Phil's right is Mark Henkel from Citrix. So if we can go down the panel and have each one of you introduce yourselves, let us know what do you do, where you're from, and what's your interest. So my name is Bertrand. I'm from the French-speaking part of Switzerland. I work for Adobe as a senior developer in the CQ5 team, which is a large-scale content management system. I'm not really a business guy, but I did have my own business for 18 years before joining Day Software, which uh, then got acquired by Adobe. Uh, Phil Robb, uh, Hewlett Packard. I run the open source program office for Hewlett Packard. Um, and that role is somewhat of a mix of working with the community and working with the different business units inside of HP. I run our open source program office um, and the open source review board. Uh, I sponsor and participate in events like this and work with the teams within HP for uh, basically strategically how to evolve and work with open source. Uh, from Fort Collins, Colorado, and it was rather snowy trying to get here. My name's Mark Hinkle. I uh, work with our open source relations with Citrix, particularly with the Apache Cloud Stack project and uh, Zen.org. And because of the success we've had with Apache, we're looking at uh, some new open source projects this year that we'll talk about second quarter. Fantastic, thank you. So a little bit about the panel. Um, we've been running this panel for the past 11 Apache cons. And what we normally do is I usually have a couple of questions that I'll ask the panelists, we'll have a discussion going, and then we open it up to the floor because you guys always have the interesting questions and we've got some great answers for you. So when we first started this, I think that the topics have changed considerably. We had started off in 2006 with this panel and you know, we were figuring out is open source ready for prime time, right? Is open source you know, robust enough to be in the enterprise? And at this stage, there's over 90% penetration within the enterprise, whether they know it or not, open source is there. And Apache has a significant footprint in that space. So the question is now, um, you know, Apache has clearly made a tremendous impact in the, the software ecosystem today. And we're trying to figure out, you know, why Apache? Why is it the foundation that folks come to to incubate and develop emerging innovations as well as established code bases as well as mature communities. And I'm talking about things like Subversion has come to Apache. Um, Jim had mentioned yesterday Open Office is with Apache. Flex has come to Apache. Um, CloudStack is at Apache. So why is the foundation the right group for you? So any panelists, feel free to start answering. All at once. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> I think the, 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 the defining thing is that Apache is a neutral place. And uh, you know all the Apache processes and, and, and best practices are, are meant to make it neutral, uh, which is very cool for a company because you know that uh, what what you give to Apache can be a, can be owned by anyone besides Apache, which also means it doesn't belong to you anymore, which is uh, can be uh, sometimes that you need to ex we need to explain to our colleagues sometimes. But uh, I, think it, uh, I think that's a very important factor. Having this neutral ground with very well-defined governance rules uh, is a good place to collaborate for companies. I guess um, I would answer that question is when we joined Apache, I don't know that we were all sure it was the right place for us. So it was very, we had a open source project, which is CloudStack, which is now incubating in Apache. And it was very highly debated about how we should take our project to the next level internally. 
and uh, we decided on Apache for a number of reasons. And what we found is that the Apache brand, as far as giving legitimacy to a project, has really helped elevate its status because of the, the procedures in the Apache way. Um, people, people trust that neutrality, and uh, it's actually raised our profile and, and improved our processes in a lot of ways. We had a very well-developed, it wasn't, it wasn't a new project, it was already open source under the GPL. We relicensed it under the Apache software license, which um, seemed to be more friendly to our partners and to our users. And the governance model that was neutral um, has really helped push the project forward. So I think that uh, um, I would tell you now that the Apache way and the, the confidence that people put in the Apache Software Foundation has really been a big asset to us. Yeah, and from, from, from our perspective, it's actually, um, it's even more influential than just within the Apache community itself. Um, we have lots of teams working within the Apache environment um, and within the Apache Foundation proper, but even with working with projects like OpenStack, um, which chose not to go into the Apache Foundation, but because of the maturity and the strength uh, and the reputation of the processes that the Apache Foundation have had with regard to license, with regard to license contributor agreement, uh, even the technical structure of meritocracy with program management committees or project management committees and so forth, that's the model that is commonly used and referred to now wherever a project is being created as a really best practice. And that's something that I think the Apache Foundation should be really proud of because you're leading the way in that. Fantastic. Bertrand, you mentioned that, um, you know, speaking to your colleagues, reminding them that what you have doesn't belong to you anymore. Um, the late American <coughs> author Gore Vidal had said, whenever a friend succeeds, a little part of me dies. <laughs> so it's interesting because how big of a challenge is it, you know, with, with again, open source and the Apache way and the whole community friendly kumbaya business. How much of a challenge is it to be open and community friendly and yet be competitive at the same time? I mean, again, I'm sure there's, there's a, a cultural aspect to it, but there's also real business numbers, right. com competitive element to it. Right. So this is really for the whole panel. Yeah. I think the key to, uh, to this is to choose the right scope for, for the project, for what you're open sourcing. Um, so I, I used to, to work for Day Software before uh, joining Adobe, which was a small Swiss company. and uh, we, um, about 90% of our product is based on, it consists of Apache projects. It's still the case. Now the project, the, the product is Adobe CQ5, it hasn't changed. Um, so we, we made a conscious decision to not open source the higher layers, you know, the UI stuff, uh, because first it's very hard to agree. If you ever tried like to choose a color for a button on an Apache mailing list, you can you, you're in for for some debate usually, so it's uh, it was much faster for us to keep that part uh, for us, but we open sourced all the infrastructure parts, uh, which are common and reusable, and that that's where you really benefit from collaborating with other other companies who might be competitors but need the same thing at this level, and then uh, the the benefits are are greater than than what you might lose by by opening opening it up. So I think it's a question of choosing the right uh, amount, uh, you know, the right scope in what you open source to make sure it's infrastructure and it also makes it easy to work on with other people. Yeah, from my experience in working with a lot of different projects and partners, um, I think that's really a question that hasn't been answered yet. <clears throat> um, one of the fascinating things to me about open source is when you put a bunch of technologists together collaborating on some kind of, of item, um, they self-organize and they produce better software than anybody else anyplace else. And it's really because it's all about the software. It's not about, you know, they, their users are, they know who their users are, they address their users. Very often their users are themselves, um, so they know their users very well. Um, and that model, again, is really hard to combat. Um, you know, I, I like to talk in the fact that open source communities make outstanding technologies, but they may not necessarily make great solutions. 
Um, they can put, you know, a lot of great uh, functionality out there, but, you know, I think the, the opportunity for companies is to form that up into a really well-rounded solution, because there's a variety of things that communities typically find boring and don't really want to do well. Um, so helping to fill that out uh, to provide something for customers where businesses, um, as well as supporting it long term, those are the things that businesses can do. And I, for me, that's the balance between the two and why they can work so well together. Um, I think one of the most attractive things about the uh, um, open source in general is really the user-led um, contact uh, development, but the context that they bring. And so for us, we're a software company, and sometimes we're, you know, solutions looking for a problem, but when you do open source, you get user context. And by, by having that, for us, having that more uh, intimate engagement with our users to actually lead future development and product development, it really has, you know, informed how we develop our software and what features are there and why it's going to get better. And I think that, to me, is, um, is really what, what has taken us forward and is, is while, while it is a, lock of, a loss of control, as, as Sally said, it is also, you know, you do get, get much more than you give away when you really embrace that. I think there's also an interesting aspect with respect to the integration. Again, you know, a lot of companies are saying, okay, we're open source friendly or we're incorporating open source. Uh, that happens on a software development technical side. In Mark's instance, you know, your organization is very diverse. You have many business units that, you know, are not even software oriented. Um, Bertrand, you're coming from an organization that got acquired by uh, Adobe and, you know, yes, they now very visibly have uh, an, an open source presence and activities, the same with Citrix. Um, it's, it's interesting that on the panel now we have three organizations that were not natively, again, your former life was, but are not natively in their DNA open source. So seeing that, you know, folks are involved, uh, sleeves rolling up on the developer side saying, okay, we, we get the Apache way and we implement it across the board. Bertrand, I know you're giving a talk about open development. I know that's a significant part of what you do. Mark, I understand that your team is very heavily involved with governance. You know, it, it's interesting. That I know that you guys, and also Phil, your, your group also is very involved with governance. How has that influenced the way the organization is working as a whole? You know, has the Apache Way and other open source uh, activities involved and has influenced your organization beyond just software development? Mark's laughing. <laughs> it's actually, you know, it's caused a good bit of strife and some pain because it's a culture change. I mean, when we were open source before Apache, but we weren't quite as democratic. So there is the, and you know what? I, I would love to tell you that I just loved it from day one, but every day it's a little bit of a struggle because I move at a, I, well, as a company, you want to move at a certain pace. And I've heard in multiple talks this week that Apache moves on Apache time. And, you know, at first I, I had a hard time grasping that because I want to get stuff done, I want to get product out. But the reason it works is also because there's a process and if you follow that process, you get a good result. So I think uh, um, we find a lot of times that we're at odds with the pace that our community needs to move at and our business needs to move at and that's, you know, as anyone here who works in, in a, works at selling free software, you, you, f you figure out that you need to uh, um, embrace it and not fight it and it goes a lot better. But you also have to really understand that Apache culture and, and uh, that's, that's something that you gotta work at every day or else you're not gonna succeed. Yeah, and the model, the model is a, it's, it's a continuing evolution, right? There are, there are many product teams inside of HP that fully understand and get it, and they've adapted the model because, again, most of their code base or significant portions of their code base are based on an open source project. And so they understand, you know, what that collaboration means, what they're going to get from the community, what they need to give to the community, and how that equates ultimately into, again, a solution for the customer. Um, but 
it's, I mean, again, that's part of the fun of my job is I get to go around and try to explain this to folks who haven't quite seen it yet. Um, and there are still many folks that are that way, both inside and outside of HP. I would say the um, one important aspect of the open source model and that often creates a tension with the company, you know, the, the how do you say, maybe the old company model, hierarchical and stuff, is the meritocracy. Uh, it, I think it's a natural thing for engineers to, to be meritocratic. You will respect someone because, they, because of what they can do in the project. And that, that's what we do in Apache. Your, your power is only uh, measured in terms of how much added value can you bring to this area of the project. And, uh, and uh, sometimes we have, uh, you know, stars coming as committers to a new, new Apache project. They don't have special status. They, they're a committer like everybody and they have to be elected and stuff. Uh, this is very different from the old company model where you, you had the power because you, you are the boss. Someone tells you, oh, no, you, now you are the boss. <laughs> so, you, so people just have to do what you say. Um, Obviously, you need some form of bosses in a, in a large organization. You need some, some order and you need to ship stuff. So someone has to say at some point, okay, tomorrow is the release. Do whatever so that we can release it. And then there's a tension with, between that and the meritocracy. And uh, I think there, there's good progress being made in, in general in companies in, in making, making more sense of that. You know, how can you combine the meritocracy with some form of leadership uh, that, that's required by, by the business? And meritocracy is great because I think a lot of folks feel like they can buy their way into the foundation. Oh, we'll become platinum sponsors, we'll have, you know, <laughs> special access allowed to us, or we'll be able to, you know, commit code at a higher level than someone else, or what we choose to do on the project management committee is going to dictate the way a project goes. So it's very interesting to see that it is really based on the individual and individual contributions. Um, what's interesting also, again, in the evolution of open source adoption is for years people were saying, okay, we're getting involved in open source because of the cost savings, right? So back in the day it used to be, you know, build versus buy, and then open source comes along and you go, well, you can just borrow and sometimes give back. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, there's an issue about um, cost savings in general, even now, I mean, again, we're talking about lar larger organizations, market valuations shifting. Um, Accenture recently had a survey that stated CIOs, actually cost savings is the least of their concern, and yet folks are saying, hey, wait a second, I want to get onto this gold rush because there's some money to be made here. Um, there's been a projected uh, valuation for the Apache Hadoop market to exceed $14 billion over the next four years. We're talking about big money to be made and everyone's kind of holding their hand up and saying we want to be a part of that. So talking about money, um, you know, again, there's, there's powerhouse products out there. Apache seems to be behind a lot of them or enabling a lot of them, pushing a lot of those projects out there. And a lot of companies are taking them up and saying we want to be a part of this. So what do you guys think are the biggest challenges? And, and, and Phil had mentioned uh, education is, is an ongoing issue. And again, I presume the, 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 the topics now in terms of education have shifted greatly. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think are your biggest challenges that lie ahead? And that's challenges in what context? Opportunities, problems, what keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, from a, from a standpoint of, of um, I've watched the, the, I've watched both internally and external uh, to HP, the concept of saving money being less and less important. Um, as teams get into open source, they recognize it really is about the flexibility that affords them. Um, as Sally said, you used to have buy versus build, right? And if you build it, it's custom, uh, it's typically very expensive, uh, half the time it doesn't actually make it to fruition. Uh, you know, the, the rate of IT projects dying somewhere along the road to uh, first release is pretty large uh, in the history of, of corporate IT. Um, so COTS was the big buzzword, right? Back in the 90s, early 2000s, you wanted to do everything common off the shelf. And when open source really took hold, it created this middle ground where very often you can treat open source as COTS. You can buy Linux from Red Hat and they'll treat it just like a version of Unix from any other vendor. Um, for us um, and for so many of our customers, you know, the ability to bring a piece of open source in, treat it as though you wrote it. Um, meaning you can fully support it, you create a relationship with the community, that code can be treated as yours, or if you choose, um, 
you can have a variety of vendors help you either extend it or support it or do whatever. Right? That level of flexibility with such an important asset in any company, that being software, um, for me, that's one of the big dynamics that has changed. From a challenge perspective, um, again, the, the conversations have changed, but the real challenge that, that, that I continue to see is just um, how to embrace open source, recognize you lose control beyond what it is you can do yourself, um, but to take advantage and to actually just participate in that community and very often really good things come back. And that's, it's just a culture change, right? Um, you talk about, uh, you know, we, we have teams where traditionally, you know, it's been, you know, the architect designs it, their lead developers split up the work, their teams do the release, they put it on the release schedule, and that's the way things are done. And when you introduce uh, the notion that, okay, now we're not gonna do that all on our own, we're actually gonna participate in this outside community. You know, not only is it new for the managers, but it's very new for that architect. He's very used to creating a design and mandating what that design is, and it just starts to happen. Right? Well, there's a whole group of people now he's got to convince that that's a good idea. And that takes a lot of time. Um, so you know, acclimating everybody from management through the engineering staff as to what it really takes to participate and work in a community, um, that's the challenge now. And it's just because the reason why that's so important is because open source um, is so critical at this point to software development. You can't do mobile, you can't do big data, you can't do cloud, right? All of the major areas um, of computing advancement today are all based on working in these communities. I think I'd echo what Phil said as far as for us predictably bringing products to market. Um, the uh, open source is changing too. In the old days, you used to say, you know, Linux, it's just like Solaris, but free and open source. But <laughs> now you have things like Hadoop where there is no legacy technology that the open source guys are commoditizing. They're actually innovating and leading a charge in big data and cloud and places like that. So you have these communities where they're, they're on the leading edge of innovation versus somewhere like Red Hat where they were, were giving you that safe, stable um, version of a product that you understood. Now we have you know, massive innovation going on in the big data space and cloud space that, that people can't have no comparison to. And as a company that has to bring products to market, you're always challenged by customers asking for these leading edge features that you haven't had a chance to, to vet the way you would have and plan the way you would have in your traditional software development model. So um, we, we have that balancing act between giving them the stability and the support that they need for their, for their businesses as well as taking advantage of the innovation that's coming from our communities. I would agree that the, the focus is not that much on, on the costs anymore today. I think the focus in the software industry is on just making things work very, very reliably. If you go back 10 years ago when, you know, when the personal computer was the standard, people were getting used to software not working. How many times, you know, uh, I need to reboot. I got blue screen. This is not, you know, oh, reboot your computer. And, and people were getting used to that. And this was very bad because, you know, people would just accept that, oh, computers never really work. You always have to, to tweak something. Today, with the mobile devices, when you get out your phone or your tablet, it just works. And, and we're getting used to that. We're getting used to stuff just working. And we are faced with very complex systems behind that, all the backends and the collaborating system, distributed systems. So I think, I think today the focus is on getting the system to work very reliably. And uh, I would echo what, what uh, Theo Schosnegel was saying uh, yesterday on this, uh, you know, need to do that, you need a generalist who's able to understand the whole stack, starting maybe from hardware up to, up to the, the, the system integration. And open source enables that, because you can look at the whole stack and you can understand it, or find someone who understands it, and they can have a detailed look, why is this thing not working? So I think one of the challenges is educating the developers that they can do that. You, you, don't, you know, you, they should start, uh, stop looking at just their own corner and be, try to be aware of the whole thing. And I think that's a big, uh, 
th that's a big edu educational challenge for, for people who are not familiar with this way of, of working. And speaking of educational challenge, is, is it still an issue in terms of who is Apache? I mean, if folks, okay, they understand 404 not found and go, oh yeah, I know those guys. Is, is it becoming more common that folks are saying, oh yeah, I, I understand Apache because of Hadoop or I understand Apache because, you know, we get where they've come over the past 14 years or how hard is, is a sell in terms of Apache? It does not, not even matter. I think it's still a sell. Um, you know, being being involved and in, 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 in part of this for so long, it's it's easy to see how much value the Apache Foundation as a whole brings beyond the web server. But you have this this branding problem benefit of having such a strong initial project out there that is so dominant. Most many folks that I run into still don't understand how deep the portfolio. Right. Not to mention, again, all of the governance and all of the groundbreaking work you've done as a foundational organization in open source. So now, I, I just, actually, for many, it's still an education. And I think on our side, for Apache, we, we very, very deeply suffer from aw shuck syndrome. So it's, it's kind of hard for us. I think the projects that have a very strong corporate backing have a tendency to be a little bit more higher visibility because behind the foundation, there's a company that's pushing that and putting their own marketing and PR dollars behind it. And I think it's, it's interesting because, like you said, Apache is pervasive. I mean, across the section, I remember people were talking about financial services and were surprised to see how much Apache was there, um, considering that back in the day, financial services were so afraid, risk-wise, of getting involved with something considered unreliable like open source. And yet, we're there and we're delivering every single day in mission-critical applications. We're, you know, NASA's using us, the military's using us. I mean, we're, we're there. And so it's it, part of it is, you know, I think that's the, the beauty and, and uh, the, the charm of the foundation is that it's a bunch of individuals saying we're just guys doing great work. You know, it's just people doing good things for the world. And yet, I think on a corporate standpoint, they want to say, you know, we are partnering with you. We're putting money towards you. We want to have more visibility from the organization itself because we know, you know, when it's budget time, right, and people say, who is this and what's this line item, um, why should we care? And again, for me, the interesting thing is, you know, even when you have such heavy corporate momentum behind a project such as OpenStack, they look at the Apache model and say, look how they've separated the business and the foundational aspects from the technical community. We must preserve the technical meritocracy, keep those two at arm's length. And that's the model that they follow, right? And again, that was all originated out of here. Um, and it's, it is the model that smart organizations <laughs> use, right, to make their projects successful, because that's a critical part, right? There's so much that a corporate uh, backing can do with regard to marketing, trademark protection, you know, there's just a lot of things that can really help. Um, infrastructure for getting the development done, um, but making those separate is such a key. And again, it was originated out of here. Yeah, I would add that um, the, uh, while Apache <clears throat> doesn't have it in that marketing cachet, it sort of has that good housekeeping seal of approval effect. And uh, I used to like to say about the cloud stack that it was the best kept secret in the cloud because people, it, it worked very well, but they didn't have that level of trust. And I recently saw a, uh, a report from IDC about what three cloud platform, the top three cloud platforms people were gonna look at at 2013. And the top one was Microsoft's Azure. Microsoft's a $250 billion company. Um, VMware, which is number two, um, with a, and they're a $25 billion company. Number three was Apache Cloud Stack, and the 2011 tax return for the Apache Software Foundation was $710,000. Okay. So just to see that, that we were competitive, and the, and the usage for numbers was 60% of all people that were looking at cloud were going to look at Apache Cloud Stack. So that's a testament to me to the power of that good housekeeping seal of approval um, that, uh, that Apache gives people who are, are going to use technology and buy infrastructure. They're going to, they're going to invest in Apache projects. So. It's an also interesting point in terms of money driving the market or money not driving the market in terms of adoption. So like looking at Gartner reports, um, you know, the foundation's always, you know, Apache projects are always hitting, you know, the, the magic quadrant over and over again for the past 14 plus years. And people are going, you know, how are they able to do this with literally, what is it, $700,000 that we have? 
or something like that, right? It's, it's all volunteer, how is this even possible? So it's, it's an amazing testament to the Foundation's ability to be able to keep it going. What I want to do is, we've got a couple of people who have kind of been sitting on their hands ready to jump up. We've got a couple of microphones in the center aisle, and I think it's time to take some questions because some of you are looking mighty curious. So instead of tweeting the question, come up and ask. My name is Steve Hathaway. It's not so much a question, but an observation. I've been involved in some of the uh, mature Apache projects that have become a fundamental foundation of business processes. And some of the projects have, been, have seen little maintenance, but the business community still sees a lot of benefit in it. And my reason for getting involved in Apache was to uh, bring the uh, maintenance infrastructure back into some of these critical projects that are endemic and, and needed by business. And uh, part of the maintenance that I've uh, found is that businesses are willing to do quality control. And I submit the uh, pre-releases of some of these projects back to business and it, they give us the results and approval and, and identity of problems for additional work, even though some of these businesses uh, do not uh, provide uh, direct, uh, direct feedback into the groups. Their, their quality control infrastructure and business labs are very important on some of these legacy projects. Before you leave the microphone, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. I, I know the project you're talking about, and it was one that was actually threatened to be mothballed into the Apache incubator, uh, sorry, the Apache uh, attic because there was lack of activity. That the, is correct. The, the challenge is that we have a lot of projects, right? We've got nearly 150 initiatives going on at the foundation, and you know, because it's open source, anyone can take it and use it. Fantastic. So what is the market's responsibility to contribute back to it? You know, it's, it's not a sexy project that you're working on, and yet it, it powers core functionality for many, many large organizations. Um, it, you know, getting quality control is fantastic, but what do you think is a way to incent companies to participate beyond just taking the code? Because if we don't have a viable, active community or a code base, then the project eventually will get mothballed if it's not being maintained. So you got these guys to help out. What do you think? Basically, it's it, making, it, talking with some of the engineers and their engineering project managers. It's also sharing the information with students at universities, it, putting projects out for it, work for Google Summer of Code to increase the community, it, the individual community participation. Uh, that also helps to uh, bring life back into projects that are going dormant. I would add that I think it's uh, the responsibility of all of us as, as employees of our, our respective employers to educate our colleagues that they should bring this information to the project. You know, in, in just sending an email to the dev list saying, hey, we tested this, it's, it's cool. And we, we measured the 12% improvement in performance on the last release or whatever. Or, or blog about it and make that, make that visible. There's a tendency sometimes uh, for, uh, for employees to just keep the information in their, in their internal group, in their company, because they, they think it's enough. And it's not. If you're using an open source project, I think it's your responsibility to, to contribute whatever, whatever you can to it. And that can, might be just some test reports. That, that's very valid, I think. Uh, on that same note, I also have been, when I receive kudos and good works from the business community, being chair of a project and a committer in another, I share the good news and the and the testing that the corporate vendors have been doing on our projects back to the list to help 
instill confidence that the project is well maintained? I definitely agree in terms of allowing the developer community understand that your code matters and it's actually being used and appreciated. I, again, I, I think if, if feedback is low, it's very hard for us to understand where the reach is. And when you and I privately spoke yesterday, I had no idea that the, the, the depth of organizations that were using this particular project, because in my head, it was just a common belief that that project is dead. And I had no idea that it was being used in so many mission critical applications. And yet, if we didn't know that, you know, how would we know? So thank you for that. Any other panelists want to comment? On to the next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Noreen. Um, it's well known that Apache is a great place for a variety, a great diversity of corporations to come together and cooperate and collaborate. Um, but it's been suggested this week that there's no economic incentive to encourage greater diversity among the individual participants. As economic actors and contributors to the foundation, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. I think uh, if you look at the business of software, the number one cost for us is not development. It's actually sales and marketing and acquisition of customers. And so if you look at someone like an Oracle, um, even a Red Hat, their, their cost of revenue is 60 to 80 percent for customer acquisition. And the open source model in general is a much more efficient for customer acquisition because we don't need to go out there and do trials and our users are our strongest marketing voice and our um, pre-support comes from IRC and from wikis and mailing lists and by the time that we talk to our potential customers we're not talking about installing the software we're not talking about the bugs. People, people are educated on our software generally and they're in a position to make a buy decision. So that cost is mitigated um, as well as the fact that we, we sort of get market research. It helps in our leverage in every part of our business. We get, you know, pro the, having JIRA bugs and feature requests is product, market, or product management that we could only dream of if we did it ourselves. Um, hiring I know um, not so much Citrix, but Netflix has a huge open source project in the cloud right now that has really helped them in their hiring because they're getting people in the projects. And it's like an audition, and before you know it, they've got high quality engineers in their open source. So if you look at, look at your business, virtually every area of your business, you can get leverage through the open source model. And, if you're smart about it, you're gonna, you're gonna get marketing, you're gonna get product management, you're gonna get development, which ironically is, this is a group of product developments, it's usually one of the smaller costs in bringing software to market. Um, so, so that whole idea of leverage um, is, is, is big in our business and it helps us grow our business with less, less capital. When you talk about diversity, and I, I took the question to mean something a little bit different, so could you elaborate? Um, yeah, I was talking more about the diversity of individual contributors mm. um, rather than the diversity of, of the corporations involved. Oh, right. And I, uh, and I, I have a personal interest in uh, education and STEM education in particular. Um, uh, HP does a variety of things, like we run a technology camp for girls, because about the sixth, seventh grade, it seems that engineering type of topics become uncool. Um, I'm fascinated to continue to read the studies about the variety of reasons why people think that women drop out in particular um, out of software engineering. Um, I've, watched, uh, I've watched the open source community um, mature and I think get significantly better about being sensitive to um, you know, the way things are presented, the, the, the tone in which it is presented in uh, conferences as well as a variety of projects. Um, there are still a lot of places where it's really harsh and I think that, you know, that has been identified as a deterrent, right? And I see some level of modest progress in those areas, but for me there's, there's still a really unsure 
sense of why this happens. You know, I can tell you from a corporate standpoint, we look at the disparity between men and women in a variety of, of job categories, and we don't like it. And we want to fix that, and it's, it seems to be something relatively hard to fix because we don't understand uh, why that as a, as a vocation seems to drop out of, of so many women's minds, in particular, again, just talking from a diversity standpoint about, about sex. Um, so, I don't know, do you have any thoughts? I have plenty of thoughts, but my question was really, do you see an economic lack of, in a lack of economic incentive to, to try and fix this problem? It's, it's a hard problem, and how we fix the problem is, is a totally separate question, and I don't want to take up this whole panel. Um, but it's interesting to hear from, from you all as, as economic actors whether you see an economic incentive or disincentive to addressing it. Right, and I, and I think there's always a very strong economic incentive to have diversity because that diverse set of opinions and, and points of view are what drive really, really good solutions and innovative solutions. So no, I think we as an industry are missing the boat. Thanks, that answers my question. And I think open source is, is an excellent example because if you look at, the, at our projects in Apache, how diverse they are just in terms of cultures and you know, where people come from, we see that it's a, it's a big plus. So obviously having also diverse, more diversity in terms of, of men and women will, as you say, will certainly improve that as well. No question? Yes, my name is John Wen. Uh, I'm working for an enterprise software de de development, web development platform. But for me, Apache definitely, you know, for you know, for last over 12 years, you know, it has been so important to, to the software industry. For my company, actually, if it's not Apache, I don't want to use it. It's just so important. But uh, you know, uh, the things really sometimes uh, I, I I want to point out something here. You know, it's think of the, you know we know this Apache started in 1999, and up to today, this is kind of really a software. Compared with Microsoft, you know, the size is small, but to me, it's kind of really an empire, I mean, in the industry, because it's so important, moving the world in many ways. So, so many companies support that. That is a great thing. But to me, it's like, you know, it's an empire with 3,000 knights, you know, I'm mean, talking about the programmers, you know, doing this. The things that develop, you know, is so complicated, and it's so, uh, so, so important, like this Hadoop thing, you know, and uh, for the last several years, it definitely is changing the, it is changing the world. My point is, you know, right now, you know, Apache's organization with, with so many com uh, programmers, you know, throughout the whole world, the model definitely work, you know. But what is next step, you know, for example, Apache, imagine next five years, 10 years, how is this going to change the whole world, you know? Uh, there's a lot of things I think, I don't know, Apache organization is going to, you know, take this something to the next level. For example, the education, definitely is huge. I mean, talking about, it's just that getting this Hadoop thing, you know, populated, you know, across the whole uh, the, uh, programmer uh, world, it is a big thing, you know. Uh, can we take some other model? Like, you know, we love to come here. Even being here just uh, kind of earn a kind of a pride and honor, really, because it's so important opportunity for us to see this, you know, the, the, the creator of this great, great software. But can we, Apache, have something to do, you know, make this, uh, this Apache brand is uh, huge, I think. You're talking about Apache in business, that's, is huge. I'm mean, talking about, you know, we need to get uh, more developers involved. Is Apache have in the future have any plans to like uh, set out some uh, uh, sub chapter to, like, in the sub regions, just like a boy a boy scout thing, you know, and they make this uh, the software uh, well, you know, you know, uh, you know, learned quickly by the communities, you know, actually using this. I I would like that I don't know if anything makes sense of this because just that's very very interesting. That's a good question. Um, we, we have several board members here. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I know that, Rich, I don't know if you want to talk about it, or Jim, if you want to talk about this. I, I, it happens like every year, you know, we, you know we, we've got our board elections and the foundation's going, and, and I'm the vice president of marketing and publicity, so I, I get what you're saying. And I get asked all the time, analyst Shane, you're a former board member, if you want to talk about this, come on along. 
we get asked from the analysts and the press, you know, what's your plan? What's the 10-year plan for the foundation? And, you know, we, we do not necessarily have these growth projections. You know, we're not an organization like a normal company that says we want to make a certain amount of sales because we gave our software away. We don't want to bring in a certain amount of developers. We're not saying we want to, you know, grow to 200 top-level projects. As far as I understand that, that's not really anything that we've ever had the, you know, the, the war board in the office and have ever said, let's get together and figure out the next strategic move for the foundation. But again, there's several members of the board that I would love to hear your input on this. Jim, you want to talk about it, or Rich, or Bertrand, you want to? Speak to it. Oh, Jim. Jim. All right, here comes Jim. <laughs> I already did the hat confusion tricks in the lightning talk, so <laughs> let's not try that here. I'll use uh, Sally's microphone for this. Um, yeah, as Sally said, I mean, we really don't have a strategic plan. I, I think what what makes the ASF special is that uh, we have always maintained the idea. Uh, of a really, really tight association between developers and users. I mean, everybody who develops the code is using the code. So we have um, basically our, our fingers into newer technology because we're the users of that technology, but also the developers of that technology. So being basically at the ground level, at the grassroots area of technology is coming on board, allows the ASF to sort of like see what that new technology is and help develop it. And also the very fact that we have this very great association with companies and corporations, you know, they're able to also provide to developers the kind of feedback and insight that rank and file developers never, would never be able to see. I mean, for example, uh, you know, what are some scalability problems that as a developer I may never see, but may be affecting Adobe or, or, or IBM or Red Hat or something like that. And so the very fact that we have this great tight feedback loop between users and developers and the ASF and companies which are also pushing uh, the state of the art, you know, the beating edge, I think that allows Apache and the developers inside of Apache to, um, uh, to, to figure out what those new technologies are. Um, and, and we're able to, to ride that wave of development and advancements um, because we're just, you know, so tight to where that, that is. But as far as us coming up with this idea that's saying like, okay, uh, next year we need to focus on this aspect, um, that's something, honestly, I think companies do, corporations do, they try to come up with a strategy. They try to come up with something that they need to sell because you need to create that infrastructure to be able to get to the point where you're developing a technology that you can produce. Whereas we more uh, are there to facilitate uh, new technologies that uh, their company can, can then consume and leverage. And I know that Rich and Jane are, are also waiting. Thank you, Jim. Can I, can I just, it? just to address the, what Jim was saying there is that's the, the micro level of how our projects work and how uh, we grow projects in terms of the developers and the users being together and naturally interested developers will find interesting technologies and might come to Apache and will drive that kind of thing. That's how it works. The, the bigger picture of why it works, it, this sounds trite, but the purpose of the Apache Software Foundation, our, our mission is to provide software for the public good. So we've done a lot of work thinking about good ways to do things to minimize the amount of rules that we have for our projects to make it very easy so that our projects can succeed. And we try to maximize the things that we can provide to our projects. So at the foundation level, our mission isn't to follow cloud or to look for the next big, big thing. Our mission is to allow like-minded communities to succeed in doing what they want to do. So the, the idea of the ASF being a service to its projects and its communities, and the idea of a charity in terms of, our mission is to give away software, good software, excuse me. Let me let me add that point, that's important. <laughs> um, but that really, at a deeper level, drives what the foundation invests in and what the foundation provides for its projects. But what the projects want to do is completely up to the projects. So in, in that way, Jim's point is, it, it is often corporations that end up helping to drive some of that because they're looking ahead. But we're happy to host any like-minded community and we'll support them all. Shane said what I was going to say. Um, the role of the board is to get out of the way of projects and let them do what they want to do. So Shane already said that. 
I think it's also important to remember that the foundation with its infrastructure and with its framework allows anyone to contribute. Um, in past Apache cons, Shane used to get up during the lightning talks and sing this, you can hack anything you want at the good old ASF. I don't know if you're going to sing this here, Shane, or not, but um, it's, it's true. I mean, anyone can come. The barriers to entry and, and the meritocratic elements that people talk about is, yeah, you have to produce good code. You're not going to break the foundation and the process of coming up with something. We have a tremendous amount of folks here that have never been to ApacheCon before, and we love that. We have a tremendous amount of people that are here that are new committers. We love that. We are trying to make sure that it's not a good old boys network. You know, anyone can participate. If there's something that you want to do and you have a great idea, this is the place to do it if it's the right fit for you. And so I think that's the appeal of Apache. So whether you're an individual contributor that's interested in the project, you can do that. Or if you're an organization that wants to bring your own established code base to the foundation, you can also develop that. Thoughts from the panel? I mean, the only thought that I have is as I look at the organization, um, not only does it seem to be functioning really, really well, but it has tremendous influence, again, across the entire software industry because open source has such an influence. And again, the Apache Foundation is such a model for how to do foundations and supporting open source projects uh, throughout their entire life cycle. So I guess it's, it's how you measure it. I mean, if you measure it from general consumer marketing, do they recognize the Apache brand? Do you have enough resources to function to the level that you want to function at? And if you do, um, you know, if that's, if, if that's all in place, uh, your influence as a measure um, is just huge. I mean, you're terribly successful, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it really depends on what it is you're shooting for. And what I think I just heard from the directors was it's really fundamental. It's really about, again, letting users and developers create great software. In the last couple of years, there's uh, been this uh, prevalence of uh, open source projects on GitHub, right? And uh, it's almost like the wild, wild west in some ways in that there's just this plethora of them, you know, and it's somewhat confusing, but people are using that to sort of build some measure of community dynamics, um, sharing code, using the Apache license often. Um, I guess my question to the panel is, um, given that this is relatively new phenomena, and is it causing you to somewhat redefine what goes into GitHub, what goes into the ASF as a governed project with nice visibility, et cetera? Yeah, I would say in our case, that's, um, that, that's discussions that we've been having with some groups. Um, if we have a, a so I'm not, I cannot speak for the whole of Adobe because it's too big, but for in, in the groups that I'm working in, uh, if we have a strategic infrastructure project, it will go to Apache because of the long-term guarantees that the, that the model governance uh, provides. Uh, some other groups say, okay, we want to go to GitHub because for the type of things we're doing, that's the right place to be. There, there's kind of a perception that if you're doing JavaScript front-end stuff, it belongs on GitHub. I don't know exactly why. It could very well work in Apache, but there's, there's both the fact that you could be maybe running a bit faster and you don't need to, you know, don't need to have any process, which might be f fine at the beginning, beginning of the project, maybe. But yes, that's a question we've been asking in, for for several projects. And the cowboy itis that you described, the wild, wild west aspect to it, I don't think is going to change. I think that's that's been the nature of the ASF since day one, since I've been there. I, I think that's that's part of it. And. Yeah, I think in some instances it can be somewhat a negative experience because some folks are not ex expecting that because they're coming from a more corporate background. But I think it's also allowing the better project emerge as a result. And I, I think it takes a little bit of understanding of the culture and it takes a little bit of tenacity in terms of trying to distinguish, maybe you need a divining rod, right? Is it, is it what's right for the project and is it right for the technology versus is it the right for an individual? We've had individuals who've started projects actually leave because the future of the project is better in a different direction. And, and, and ASF is okay with that. And I think it's, it's something that, you know, we have to remember that it's, it's on paper, Apache doesn't, it, it shouldn't work, <laughs> but it does. And, and I think part of it is we're hands off on a, on a governance level, on, on a board level, you know, we let the projects run themselves. And so everyone's gonna have a slightly different approach um, some might be a little bit more active than others, but I don't see that going away anytime soon. But your mileage may vary. Mark, did you want to mention anything? Uh, I would just say to the, the GitHub phenomenon, I, I think that um, 
as a rule, most every piece of um, open source that we, we invest in and we want to develop, we developed within a framework that's either Apache or um, our Zen community. And the GitHub is really for plugins and fringe development that, that is not maintained but pluggable. And that sort of helps us provide that, that innovation and freedom for people to create their own sub-projects without our governance. But it also keeps things like <clears throat> Apache is excellent at, at um, IP management. And I like to, to have our core project there. And then the pluggable stuff can be in GitHub or one of the other forges. And it's, it's not, not, an, not a risk for us or our users. Gives them the freedom. OK, thank you. All right, one last, oh, sorry, go ahead. And then we can have I, one last question yeah. before we run out Just of Just br briefly ask some, uh, add something about that is that what people often don't realize that is that by default, the GitHub model is undefined governance, undefined license, undefined ownership. And that, that's cool if you're doing a small thing. And, but if you, if, you know, as, uh, as, uh, as we were saying, as soon as the thing becomes bigger, more important, you should ask these questions. The, on the other side, the, the GitHub tooling is fantastic. So you, you, you gain that. But you have to be careful about the, these aspects if they are important for the project. Greg Stein, one of Apache's board members, has formulated a long-term challenge to our projects, and that's that he challenged them to last 50 years. And I was wondering from the panelists, how would Apache projects that, uh, that last for 50 years fit into your corporate long-term plans? Good question. We have a stunned panel. <laughs> I don't know, 50 years is an awful long time in the life cycle of a piece of software. Um, so much changes, right? I mean, I don't think it's probably appropriate for a variety of open source projects or pieces of software in general to, to have a lifetime that is significant for 50 years. Um, things evolve, you know, to the point where you know, we can't imagine what things look like 40 years from now, right? So there's gonna be software that becomes obsolete. For me, the question is more, how do you build a life cycle process that allows for new projects that are addressing new things, ultimately supplanting existing projects? And again, with the incubation process, with how that works, how you grow, how you become a mature project within this governance model, for me, it's more about that evolutionary management and the recognition that, that um, that's going to happen. You know, when I look at Linux in particular, I see a fascinating piece of technology. And while, you know, some will argue that, yes, it was the remake of Unix, for me, it's, it's so much more than that because, you know, it's really the first time the largest server or the little thing that's sitting in your pocket is sitting on the same code base. And the amount of innovative leverage that goes between those two is just mind-boggling to me. So when I look at a technology platform for operating systems, I say, gee, this is one that's actually going to last 50 years. But when I step back and I think about it, it's like, well, maybe not, right? I mean, there may be so much change that I can't recognize that, you know, it, Linux will be supplanted by something else. I mean, I really can't tell. So for me, that's, that's a really strong challenge. I think it's more important that we have the structure to continue to let software be developed in the meritocracy that it is where technology and um, the innovation of that technology is what's paramount within our body as opposed to any other um, driving force. I'd just add, I think the challenge isn't the projects to last 50 years, but the communities to last 50 years exactly. and evolve with the technology. So yeah. I think that's, that's probably the spirit of what he was asking. But, um, that would be my two cents. Yeah, I would assume Greg is pushing it a bit when he's saying 50 years. But in our case, we do have products that we need to support for 10 or 15 years, which is already an extremely long time in software. Our, that, that Sigify product that I'm working on, our customers have that kind of you know, uh, scope of lifetime. So f just having the, something that lasts for 15 years with, with, with your working community is already a big feat. And once you do 15, I, I think you can do 50. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. We are heading into the keynote time for Steve Holden to join the stage. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you in the hallways for additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.